I was just uh, in Philly. We stayed in a very nice hotel. But the, the one, the one problem with the hotel was, I don't think I think the alarm clock in the next room came on like ten to seven, very very loud, and uh, and I don't think anybody was in there. I think somebody left it on because the music just played for a while, but it was okay because of some songs I liked. And <laughs> and through the wall, after about ten fifteen minutes of, of that, through the wall came John Lennon's Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven above us, all right? No hell below us, all right? Above us, only sky, all right? Imagine, there's no heaven, all right? I want you to fix this. There's no heaven, there's no hell below us, above us, only sky. What does that mean? Hello and welcome to this special edition of News Watch. I'm Lee Webb. Is Christianity good for the world? For the next 30 minutes, we will be talking with two men who have very different answers to that question. Christopher Hitchens is a journalist who has written for Vanity Fair, The Atlantic, The Nation, and Slate. He's also author of several best-selling books, including God is Not Great. Christopher describes himself not so much as an atheist, but as an anti-theist, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Douglas Wilson is a Christian. He's pastor of Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho. He's a senior fellow at New St. Andrews College, and he's the author of several books, including Reforming Marriage and Letter from a Christian Citizen. These men have very different worldviews, but they are not strangers. Christopher and Douglas have collaborated on this book. It's entitled, Is Christianity Good for the World? It is a written exchange on concepts like truth, goodness, and beauty, and we will be addressing some of those concepts in this program. So gentlemen, thanks for being with us. Let's get started. Oh, yeah, well, tell me about the format. For a format, uh, very simple, very informal. Um, I'll start with, uh, I'll give you very brief introductions, uh, turn to Doug and say, hey, tell us in two minutes uh, why Christianity is good for the world. And then two minutes, Chris, you know, why Christianity mm -hmm. is bad for the world. Fair enough. And then I'll let you go back and forth a little bit if you want at that point, again, keep you brief, and then we just go to questions. Town hall format, students asking questions. Uh, hopefully, we have. I mean, as you saw last time, we have we have well mannered people. Certainly. Uh, yeah. and, then, and then we go upstairs and have some lunch. What's for lunch? I don't know, but man does not live by talk alone. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> This is the day the Lord has made. We, we will rejoice and be glad. Praise God from whom the saints flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Christianity is good for the world because it's objectively true, it's objectively beautiful, and it's objectively good. And you'll notice that I'm following the ancient triad of uh, truth, goodness, and beauty. Christians are not rationalists. Christians would point out that rationalists are not rationalists either. Uh, every position is a faith position. I am impressed with Douglas uh, for this very reason because very often when I debate with, with religious Jews and Christians and Muslims, what they're trying to do is say, look, well, our morality is the same as yours. We all think, we all agree what is and is not moral. Method. It's just we disagree about where it comes from. You know, he, he understands perfectly well that it's the will of God that's involved. I'm a Christian. Uh, I take it on faith. I believe that faith 
provides me with a basis for rationality. And I believe that my faith in God and His Word and, and His Christ provides me with a base, uh, an objective basis for moral considerations, moral values. Pastor Wilson doesn't, doesn't make it easy on himself in that way. He imposes on himself and on others an unbelievably strenuous burden of worry and guilt. Given that this is a fallen world, and we have to deal with our sinfulness. If you, if you insist on believing that you are depraved, as he would put it, rather than evolved, as I put it, that you labor under a burden of condemnation from your birth, rather than bear the stamp of your lowly origin, as Darwin puts it. People say, look, do you take the, are you a fundamentalist? Do you take the Bible, literally? The answer is no. But I believe it absolutely. This is a collection of 66 books over, written over centuries, uh, many different authors, many different genres, and I believe it's our responsibility to study it, understand what genre a particular book of the Bible is. Is this history? Yes or no. Is this poetry? Yes or no. Is this a prophetic uh, denunciation? Is it an epistolary letter to the Galatians? What, what is it? And then I believe it and accept it that way on its own terms. Whether the argument is celestial or original, or social or political, any of these dimensions, uh, it puts him and me, despite our good personal relations, on a side apart, divided from one another, uh, where there's no bridge that can survive. The one of us not, not, not just has to lose the argument, but has to admit a real moral defeat, and I think it should be him. Christopher, let me begin with you. How do you describe, or how would you define truth? How would I define truth? Well, I would know how to define the struggle for it. Uh, I don't believe that, as with the ob objectivity, for example, that it can be declared to have been arrived at or found or discovered. But I think there are rules of etiquette and procedure that one must follow in the unending search so that the struggle may go on. As Rabbi Hillel once put it, uh, you may not uh, ever win the battle, but you are not allowed to give it up. So, uh, would you would you say that there is a basis for truth in the world, for the, the way you described it? Well, I, I don't think that everything is relative. I don't think uh, that subjectivity or individual impressions, in aggregate, cancel each other out. No, I mean I think there are there are there are concepts such as honesty and objectivity that could help one in the struggle for truth. But I would very much doubt someone who said that they'd found what the truth was. I'd be very skeptical of such a claim. Wintry day in August, the snow was falling fast. The barefoot boy with shoes on stood sitting in the grass. Oh, ain't gonna rain no more. Ain't gonna rain no more. How the dickens gonna walk through? Christopher Hitchens is a public intellectual, which is to say he's the kind of intellectual who matters. He's a man of great abilities, he's quick on his feet. You put it modestly, but it is a fantastically arrogant claim that you make. An incredibly immodest claim, and if made by a fanatic, or by a bully, or by a murderer, I'll take it to the next stage. Isn't it rather the case that with God, anything is permissible? He's uh, witty, smart, and he writes very well. He writes preeminently readable prose. Not everybody who writes for a living can do that. And when someone, uh, when someone is engaging and, and smart, funny, um, they generally get noticed. Are you sure you've got the right guy? <laughs> Thank you. She just said she was a great fan. If I don't, if I walk several blocks and that doesn't happen, I start to get very sulky. He's written uh, on Thomas Jefferson. He's written about George Orwell, uh, and most recently, recently his. Uh, book on atheism, God is not great. With letters to the editor, or emails, it's exactly the reverse. It's like 60-40 against, or 70-30 against, anyone will tell you. So it means that a lot of people are recognizing me and thinking there's that asshole. 
that scumbag and not saying anything. And Christopher represents an alien worldview to mine. He thinks Jesus Christ was a real person, was the son of God, was crucified, dead and buried, suffered under Pontius Pilate and rose again from the dead. So I know where I am with him. He is an atheist. He believes that this world is not superintended or governed by uh, a higher benevolent power. Because I think the teachings of Christianity are immoral. The central one is the most immoral of all, that is the one of vicarious reduction. You can throw your sins onto somebody else. And I represent an alien worldview, worldview to his. If it isn't objectively true at the bottom, then to hell with it. By what right, Rabbi, do you say that you know God better than they do? That your God is better than theirs? That you have an access that I can't claim to have? There's no such thing as a standardless worldview. Every worldview has standards express or implied, and you can't function without appealing to those standards constantly. I want to base everything on the Bible. And you could, if you were to say, why do you do that? And I said, well, as it says here in Romans, right? You say, wait, 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 I'm challenging, I'm, I'm challenging your authority. You can't just flip to a verse, right? Because you, you're, you'd say, I'm begging the question, I'm reasoning, reasoning in a circle. Well, I would say the same thing here. If a person says, I want to base everything, my whole worldview on reason, and I would say, why do you want to do, why do you do that? When he turns to give me a reason, what's he doing? He's flipping open his Bible. B basically, a debate like this is more, uh, more a collision of lives than it is a, uh, an exchange of mere views. G.K. Chesterton, the great writer of the 19th century, early 20th century, said that the purpose of an open mind is the same as a, a, the purpose for an open mouth. It's, it's meant to close on something. And an open mind, in pursuit of the truth, is seeking the truth, and, and it needs to close on it so that you're not perpetually open. If you're perpetually open, then, you're, then it's a self-defeating endeavor. Part of the problem is to say that I don't believe that we have arrived at ultimate truth, which is, of course, true. We can provisionally arrive at certain truths that we can know. So, for example, if you, uh, if you say, I believe in an honest and scholarly pursuit of truth, well, that is, that is itself a truth, right? How do you, how do you know that you're, you're supposed to be honest and scholarly in, in pursuit of truth? Well, that's a truth. So there's a, there's a series of layered truths or hierarchical truths that you have to um, sort out in order to have a coherent epistemology, which is the branch of philosophy that addresses how do we know what we know? Well, you might not know what's going on on the other side of Jupiter, but you, you should know the truth about how to go about discovering it in the scientific method, and the same thing is true in history and theology and other things. You have to know certain things. You have to close on certain things. You have to stand somewhere in order to get anywhere. Let's get one thing straight, one thing clear We've got the flows and you've got the ears It's a perfect match and ain't no need to ask nobody now Let's get one thing straight and one thing clear We've got the flows and you've got the ears It's a perfect